Good evening and welcome uh, to uh, the REACM uh, joint uh, uh, presentation today. And uh, our speaker is, uh, as you all know, since you have doubtless uh, come because of him and his topic, is Professor Thung Chai Vini Chakul. I myself am the director of the Asia Research Institute. My name is Prasenjit Duara, and I will be uh, chairing it, or just basically just moderating the, the discussion. I, 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 can ima I imagine that there will be some pretty excited discussion uh, uh, at the end of this as well. Um, Professor Thung Chai Vini Chakul uh, should have a very long introduction. But luckily for, for, uh, for you and me, he gave us a very short one, so I will just uh, read that. Uh, he is a professor of history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the United States. But uh, for the last year and for another year, he will be spending his uh, time at the Asia Research Institute, where we are delighted and honored to have him there. Uh, he's a very active member, so if you want to see him uh, 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 on a separate basis, you should come there and uh, meet meet with him. Sorry to extend this invitation on your behalf, Thong Chai. Um, he is uh, most famous for his book, Siam Mapped, uh, The Geobody of a Nation, a book that uh, I have used uh, uh, often and uh, extensively, a book that had become famous even before it was uh, published uh, because uh, Benedict Anderson, the author of Imagine Communities, had uh, cited it uh, before it was published, and so it was sort of uh, whispered around long before and uh, was and certainly delivered the promise that it, uh, it contained. It, uh, it was awarded the Harry J. Bender Prize from the Association for Asian Studies and the Grand Prize for the Asia Pacific Book Award from the Asian Affairs Research Council in Japan. So uh, that's, that's all I have to introduce uh, for the moment. So let's uh, go on to have the presentation by Tong Chai. It's uh, Thailand's Crisis and the Rise of Asia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let, let's go into the topic. Uh, oh, by the way, I, my research for RE actually, and my, I have to say my main academic interest is 19th century to early 20th century, but somehow people ask me to talk about politics most of the time. Uh, so that's my, that's my baby we call my sacred life. But somehow, uh, thanks for coming anyway. I know that uh, everybody knows that Thailand has been in turmoil for some years, and the upcoming election is one of the most watched events around the globe because uh, any observer would know that uh, it's so critical to the country for, for some years to come. Okay, what most people know uh, from the news reports, focused mainly on the events, news twists and turns, and dramatic effects, mostly on the short-term future. I have to say that many reports, foreign reporting on the Thai crisis in the past few years, there are times, many times, the reporters try to put background, history, try to tell people more than just the yellow versus the red, more than just who corrupt and who got what. But uh, I think even despite those attempts, it's very hard to understand the larger historical, larger context uh, within a short piece of a news report. I myself, in preparation of, for this talk, I found that there are so much, so many, partly maybe, maybe, partly maybe I know a bit more, partly because the crisis has been long and looks like it's going to go on for a longer time, so there are a lot to say. 
So more than we need, so I decide to cut, 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 cut. Uh, most of what uh, I'm going to talk today will be contained within two or three main subjects. All of them, all of them, I look at back at the, my, my script before the talk, I found that what I cut mostly out are events and details. <laughs> so, uh, apologize in advance that uh, some details and some events that you have read in the news report might not appear again here. What I try to do is more give you two or three main fundamental factors that I think are important to understand the crisis in the long term over the past four or five years and I don't know how many more years to come. Anyway, what people know in general, just mentioned it briefly, people know about Thaksin Chinawat, his fortune, success in politics, corruptions, demagoguery, controversies, and downfall. People know about 2006 coup and uh, subsequent turmoils, including two short-term governments in 2007. People know about yellow and red polarization and too many fuse to try to recall. It's too, too many. People know the airport seized in 2007. People know the unrest in, I hope you remember that there was two killings, not one. The first one in April 2009, and uh, even more tragic in the tragic one in, in May, April and May last year, 2010. And now we know that July 3rd upcoming election. That's a sketch of the chronology. I have found that the interest in Thailand in itself in Singapore is strong. I have to admit that's stronger than I thought. And uh, this talk was scheduled before this. This talk was uh, 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 this talk was scheduled before the upcoming election was announced. So we didn't prepare, but it's good. But one of the effects is that I assume, I guess, that the interest on the events, the interest on Thai politics would be stronger. That's one reason that uh, even though the title I, I prepare, I want to talk about the Thailand case as a lens into the larger Asia. But I think about it, do people care about larger Asia right now or people care about what parties will win? <laughs> the second reason that I thought, that, okay, I will spend more time on Thailand is 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 that although I always try to think beyond the Thai case when I do my work, either 19th century or the present time, but frankly speaking, I have to admit that uh, my knowledge may be not enough to go much beyond that. So what I, I, I try to do today is to talk more about Thailand, but we'll raise a number of main questions that I think would be applicable to the, to the larger uh, to, the, to, the, to the other countries, to large issues of Asia as well. The Thai crisis has a lot to do with uh, historical and domestic conditions, but I don't think we, I hope we don't lose sight that uh, it is a symptomatic of a general trend in Asia as well. For the Thai crisis, I won't spend much time on the details, but I will talk more on the historical, structural, and larger conditions in which those events took place. I will not try to become a political astrologer, that's how I call it, forecasting what will happen in the next phase, months or years. If I could do that, I, I would quit academic career because that job requires less than PhD, earn more, and in fact, it's more exciting. <laughs> but uh, I wish I could, but I can't. So, on the contrary, I may have some comments on what steps should be taken, regardless whether or not political actors in Thailand would listen or not. I hope, I wish they listen. I'm not the only one who make those kind of comments towards the end, but let's say uh, we can only wish that they listen. Okay. There have been so many explanations of Thailand's crisis. 
most of them fall into uh, usual frames of analysis, such as events A leads to event B, C, D, and so on. This kind of frame you can find in, uh, in the journalistic reports. It helps you fill with all the details and understand the concrete, but on the other hand, we lost sight of the larger picture. Another frame which is more common in Thailand is simply about good guy versus bad guy. If I uh, modify it a bit, it between corrupt politicians and moral leaders. That is a kind of explanation widespread in Thailand for years. Getting less and less convincing, people try to think uh, otherwise, not as much because they know more about scientific, uh, sorry, uh, better uh, analytical frames, but basically because I think Thai people now realize after the crisis has been going for some years that there is nobody who is really moral. <laughs> Everybody is suspicious and, and at least can, and questionable, so they need, they need different ways to, to think about. It is also common among Thai journalists to talk about politicians versus military, different factions in various political interest groups. I'll talk about democracy versus non-military. The monarchy has been part of, the, of those frames as well, although in Thailand it was never explicit or never a focal point, except for a few people. So Prasanjit said that I was known for, so I mapped the book in Thailand. I was known as a political commentator, troublemaker, that kind of thing. People don't resign map, come on. <laughs> so the monarchy is part of, the, of, of, of those studies, but very few talk about it. I just mentioned that because I was one who, I'm one who talked about it and then uh, a few other people. But on internet, if you can read Thai, there could be hundreds or thousands that talk about the monarchy, but it has been on the internet. And as long as, as, long as the Thai authority didn't find it, if they found it, they censor, they shut it down, they do all kinds of things. But uh, to say that the, the monarchy was not explicitly uh, talked about is not quite true, but it's almost like a two worlds of political discourse in the open or in, on the internet, which we can't say that it's underground, but but let's say it's not in common political public. Most of these frames deal with events and personality that are obvious. They're not wrong. Those details and events and names, political actors, personalities are important. But the perpetuation of the crisis begs us to look beyond those frames. In fact, it took time for many empirical phenomena events and personalities to unfold and reveal to us the rest of the iceberg underneath those names and events. What is good or what is bad? I mean, a few years ago, I, I, gave, I have been giving talk on Thai crisis since 2006, at least twice a year. I look back the note, I see that I myself changed too. I mean, I'm glad that basically I didn't change in terms of, 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 of my stand or my the view in general. But how we understand the crisis, it needs time to let things unfold, to let many events show itself in different ways than we thought earlier. For example, the first main issue that I'm going to talk today about, about the change in the rural society in Thailand hasn't been a case, hasn't been an issue right after the 2006 coup. In 2007, somebody started mentioning, but the full research was, is underway right now. Only in late 2008, 2009, and right in 2010, the first, I would say, the first uh, systematic book in English is coming up, 2011 now, by Andrew Walker from ANU. So it takes time for many events and many names, many phenomena to to, I call it, just unfold and reveal itself to us before. Otherwise, before that, it, it's too messy. It's too, we can say it's too complex. Or we can say that because it's still, the dust hasn't been, I mean, the dust not settled yet. So we don't feel it. So uh, what I try to do is, is to, to uh, 
to look at the main conflict, uh, not among, not between certain names, but what are the main political forces or social institutions, including the monarchy. Once we understand that, we will see that. Uh, once we understand the larger social change underlying the crisis, it includes many paradoxes, it includes many parallel trajectories. So the mess is partly because there are so many things going on that that still, even I'm talking today, I think we need more time to to let them settle. There are reasons, there are so many, uh, those are the reasons that political obs observers uh, uh, of Thailand did not realize. That's, there are many things that they didn't realize before the current crisis. There are many things that they, didn't, uh, they don't understand and even now. For example, just one issue. I was asked so many times by, even by Thai friends, but including many uh, foreign, foreigners, many for colleagues outside Thailand, how to explain the crisis in terms of the left, the right, conservative, progressive, that kind of thing. Because as it turned out, many of my former colleagues, or I, I can even say my former comrades, the left turned right, the right turned left. We'll see in a moment that among the, I would call, more democratic force, were the same people who 34, 35 years ago participated in the massacre of the left wing. That kind of things are hard to understand. It takes time to understand how things unfold in the ways that we didn't expect. The crisis is a perfect storm. It's the outgrowth of the conjuncture of two major transitions in modern Thai history that play out in political arena. Each of these two trajectories has produced many storms of events, major and minor conflicts, controversies, and has been part of the political process long before the current crisis in 2005, 2006. But when they merge, we got the crisis as we are, as we are witnessing. The two major transitions I'm talking about is, the first one is the changing of the rural society in Thailand and its effects on democratization. Second one, the past, present, and future of the monarchy and the monarchy's role in Thai politics. You might ask, where is Thaksin, the military, political parties, and election in this frame? As I explained in, a more, in, in, in this talk, I think these two are the fundamentals. There are several more factors and agencies whose roles are significant in producing and perpetuating the crisis and to end it. But in my view, these two are fundamental. Apart from that, lots of people, most people would talk about the military. I think I agree it is important, they are important. But exactly because people keep talking about it, I'm going to mention it just a few paragraphs and move on. It doesn't mean that the military is not important in this crisis, it's not a factor, it is. But let's say for the sake of time, and I like to focus on the things that people don't pay attention to. These two things, and towards the end, one more issue that up to now, even in Thailand or in foreign press, they have not mentioned much. I'm going to talk about the anti-monarchy movement. So just give you an example that the subject that I'd like to talk more here rather than like the military that people know already. In my view, these two are fundamental. Taksin and the military, are, for example, are like genies that once were released from the lamp have become major factor themselves and they may not be put back in the lamp for years to come. Yet, we have to put all of those in the context of Thailand particular experience, and I think this is very important to understand the whole crisis. For our understanding in historical and structural terms, let's take a look at these two, and I will talk about other things much less. Once you see this on the screen, you can guess that in fact, after five, six years, in my view, the bottom line of Thailand crisis can be understood by Polyscience 101. Very simple. 
maybe I simplify it, but I think it's complex, but within this very simple frame. Politicize 101, that people take and know basically social change, socioeconomic changes, and the old political system doesn't change in time, then there are conflicts. That's political science 101. I don't want to make it uh, just roll down, right? Uh, what's the name uh, of the theories? Because there's a kind of more optimistic theories that once that conflict it will inevitably end up in a more more democratization. I'm not sure about that, about inevitability of the outcome. But let's say basically the point is that socioeconomic changes produce a new demand, a new uh, demand, the demand for the new form or the new kind of political system. But the old political system refused to go away or refused to change. So then conflict arises. The bottom line that Thailand's current crisis can be understood by that kind of policy 101 frame. Society has changed, but over the system has not and obstructed the more participatory political process. This is what I mean when I say earlier that in hindsight, the crisis is not difficult to understand. Uh, it's not as confounded as we might think, although the complexity and details within this frame are enormous. But this is also the reason why the way out is not as easy as thinking about fix the problem by uh, working about few people get rid of toxin or deal with him and would solve it? No, it's not as easy as that. Solving some problems and controversy? No, it won't solve the crisis. Having an election made the crisis would go away. It won't. Because the fundamental conflicts, the fundamental problem is much larger, deeper, and different from, I mean, those personalities or, or, or particular events. Focusing on the bottom line, we can also understand that the rise, of the rise of Asia and changes in many countries around us are generating similar trajectories. Although the particulars of those other countries may be different, meaning they may not be about the change of rural society, they may be about the growth and expansion of the urban sector and educated people. It may not be about the monarchy, it may be about, it may be about the party, it may be about a certain clan or certain um, autocrat. So details could be different. And the actual development of the tension and conflict could be different. But this Polyscience 101, in my opinion, remains a useful frame to help us understand things to come. Let's start with uh, changes in the rural society in Thailand. I'm not an economist or rural sociologist, but I try to explain it as I could, hopefully enough to understand its impacts on and, and the implications to political changes and trajectory in Thailand. In 1960s and 70s, the modernization phase of Thailand's industrialization has generated a major social change, rapid growth of urban society, a huge armies of middle class and educated population in 10 to 15 years. It was a fundamental to the rise of the popular, I mean middle class democracy. They demand, uh, and the demands by those new classes for more political participation, as seen in the uprising in Thailand in 1973, and the long process of middle class democratization uh, that last about 12, last about uh, uh, almost uh, 15 to 20 more years until the bloodshed in 1992. I'm not going to go over those details, but basically 73 to 1992 is a period when we can say that democratic middle class fought against military dictatorship and the military dominated politics to the point that by 1992, uh, the kind of civilian elected political system uh, was uh, established and the military retreated to their barracks. The political reform and a vastly popular constitution in 1997 was seen as a, as a, as a zenith, as a, as a top, as a success of this middle class democratization against the old regime, the military domination in Thai politics. 
What experts and observers didn't realize until the past few years is the changes in Thailand's rural society with similar effects on democratization. This time is not about the middle class, urban middle class. This time is about rural society. Thailand was, technically speaking, no longer agricultural society. By the end, of, uh, no longer agricultural society by the end of 1980s. In fact, the proportion of values of agricultural sector in the GDP has gradually declined since the end of 1960s. And by the end of the 80s, the most important exports in terms of values and items were no longer rice or other agricultural producers. The workforce in agricultural sector also declined steadily. And by the end of 1980s, the majority of population no longer live in rural areas. And the main source of income, their main source of income, were no longer from farms or fields around, around the time, end of 1980s. Since the mid-80s, Thailand was among the so-called leader tigers of Asia. Economic boom by the export-oriented economy raised the commodity prices. Although comparatively poorer, rural people earned more and improved their living dramatically by becoming much more connected with the urban and the global. Apart from prices and income, better education among rural people were the causes and consequences and a good indication of, social, of, the, of the change in overall. Then take a look. Child mortality is, uh, is another uh, good indication, not only of access to health services, but of transportation, communication, and living conditions in the rural society in general as well. So I steal this, well, with permission, not steal, uh, this uh, information from Andrew Walker's book that I just mentioned a moment ago. Uh, I try, I mean, the past week I plan to try to find more numbers, uh, but let's say for some uh, reason I, I couldn't have time to, to work it out, to dig it up. So as you can see, rural poverty has declined, infant mortality declined dramatically, primary school completion, which means debatable. Some people say that finished primary school doesn't mean literacy but at least it means something along that line is 100% by 2000s. People have been living on and off farms, far, on and off farm activities for the past two decades at least. Urban jobs, especially in the informal economy, provide some sizable family incomes. Increasingly, they became semi-rural, semi-urban people. There have been many well phenomena of rural folks filling up the low ends of city jobs from the northeastern food fever, uh, taxi and motorcycle transportation, uh, I mean providers of those services, office made prostitutions, of course, to textile and other labor intensive industries, including fisheries, which are not in Bangkok, but let's say more kind, a kind of industry. Urban classes in major cities in Thailand were formed by the migration of rural people. The urban-rural division is obvious within the cities, but in the larger scale of the country, it means that urban and rural division becomes blur because they move to the cities. Agricultural sector in Thailand has changed from an exploited sector, sector with low price commodities to keep the labor force relatively low wage in order to sustain import substitution and early industrialization, has, this has changed. Slightly speaking, the rural has changed from providing subsidies to, to the urban sector uh, in order to fulfill the industrialization goal. It no longer survives by just extending their hands to get government aid. Similar to other developing and developed countries, in fact, Thailand now, I mean, the rural society in Thailand now, uh, 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 the government has to provide many subsidies in terms of to, to, to sustain the food stability in terms of production, not because of low technology anymore, but because the farming has been decreasing and also people move away from the agricultural sector. They have to be, uh, the government have to spend more and more on the intensive 
intensify technology, technological development in order to, to keep the, the production. And uh, the rural people now, what they want is not government aid in terms of kind of uh, for, for help, but I mean in terms of like uh, uh, help, but they need loans. They need access to financial and non-financial possibility to expand their economic opportunities. What we call business venture is the same as in rural sector in Thailand today. They need more access to finance. They need more opportunity for their business venture. They need to expand. They need the chance to expand their product lines. Like any other urban business, pickup trucks, motorcycles, Sales phones were not for their status symbol, but also crucial to their economic life, probably more than a Mercedes to the upper class in Bangkok. When Thaksin came to power, among the things that he introduced, a million baht fund for each uh, village, as long as the village can propose what kind of projects they want to do. What else? Some kind of loan subsidies and debt defaults. The TDI, Thailand Development Research Institute, mainly economists, has criticized that this is a populist project, which is correct. But the prediction of TDI is that these are the things that have no, what's the word, economic, uh, it, has, it, 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 it won't increase economic productivity. It's a waste. It, will, buy, it will, will pile up as debt. Thaksin was heavily criticized for that before and shortly after the coup. Three years, I think three years after that, in 2008 or 2009, TDI has produced another report. And it becomes a news. I didn't collect the news, but it becomes the news. TDI sheepishly not quite admit the mistake, but agree that what people use the money for, specifically the TDI put in their original report, are two or three things that they put in specifically. Cell phone and motorcycle, those are the ways. TDI themselves found that those are very, very important for the expansion of productivity. Pickup truck is clear. Pickup truck is clear. So those are the things that we didn't realize because they lack the, the larger picture of what's going on. They think about we, or urban people, academics included, I have to say especially academics. We lost touch. We didn't know how people live. We didn't know what people need. We still see people in the rural sector as peasants. Thai people in the rural sector was no longer peasants in the sense that we define and we get used to it. was no more. Andrew Walker call it with, uh, 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 he called it middle class income peasants. I think it's a very awkward word. And many people criticize him for that. He insists that he used this. I think what his intention is, is, is to make a, an uncomfortable phrase that could, caught, could catch our eyes and try to understand it in the way he explains. <laughs> Otherwise, if we keep call something else, farmers, something, we, we, we go back to the things we get used to. So he intentionally make it a kind of uh, oxymoronic terms, middle class income peasants, it, it doesn't work, but that's what he called he call it. This doesn't mean that poverty is no longer a problem. The relative poverty is, it means economic disparity remains strong, remain worse, put it that way. It is among the worst in Asia. I forgot when I prepared this slide, there is one slide uh, produced by uh, uh, Chris Baker and uh, Professor Pasupong Paijit. Just to map incomes on the Thai map. Uh, and it turns out, I don't know, I hope it's not manipulation, I believe it is not, but somehow coincidence that almost the whole north and northeastern are among the poorest compared to the relatively affluent in the, in, 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 in the central region and of course in Bangkok. 
in the south is pretty well not bad, except the southernmost provinces, the Muslim region. So somehow that map show you can guess from that map is is a red region, is a yellow region, that kind of thing. And uh, at the uh, AAS conference in Hawaii in March, there was a paper again. I mean, for my personal reason, I couldn't have time to dig it up. Uh, uh, David Streckfurst, a scholar based in Konkan, show another map, which is a map of the, I think of the, of the, of the, I think it's a map of the voting. Uh, I can't remember, but let's say uh, it shows a map that I, when I look at two maps, Pasuk and David Streckfurst did look at each other map, but I look at those maps. It's almost like very identical, even though there are maps of different things. One is about income disparity. I think the other one is about election and something else. So uh, it's too neat. It's too identical than 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 it should it, it should be. So that's a bit striking. So income disparity uh, or relatively relative poverty remains a big problem. Uh, the most striking fact is that is the correlation between regions and disparity with the north and northeast among the poorest in the country. But when we say, when I say that rural society has changed, it's also true that the shift has shown in, uh, uh, in the statistic. It doesn't mean that culture, lifestyle, value, social networks suddenly shift, shifted or jumped in a short span. For a generation or two, the rural, the rural backgrounds, values, and lifestyle remain apparent even among people who have been living in urban areas. Indeed, every major city in Thailand now has been populated by rural-related folks, as I call semi-rural, semi-urban. Uh, years ago, decades ago, there were seasonal migrant workers. Right now, they are less and less seasonal. They're mainly in the cities, even though connections with the rural sector remain strong. Urban poor would fill the lower tiers of the city job, but they live primarily, permanently in the city. They are city dwellers, but whose life and mentality remain connected with the rurals. Why academics are slow to register these fundamental changes? Politicians, especially the ones with rural constituencies, got to know the changes firsthand. As much as we don't like politicians, it looks like in this respect, they know better than us. Thaksin's so-called populist policies were definitely populistic, but they are based on these demands of the middle income peasants. Academics and urban people saw these policies as waste, as undisciplined, I mean, to waste to rural, uh, undisciplined rural folks who could damage the country's fiscal conditions. They understood that his policy simply asked to buy votes and nothing else. To them, Thaksin created his army of followers. But given the views of rural changes that I have presented here, is it possible to say that with equal, if not better, justification to say that the rural changes make Thaksin possible? Vote buying and selling did occur in the 80s to early 90s when an election did not mean much to the rural folks. When it didn't have effects, but you get money in a way it was a very rational decision, right? It doesn't have any effect while not taking money. We're not talking about mortgage, we're talking about rational. It's very rational to sell their votes. But since the 1990s, as the changes in, rural, in economic activities among rural peoples have, be, I mean, beginning to, to, to show some effects, and competition among politicians increased, Politicians became more and more responsive to the demands of those rural needs. We're not talking about they are good guys or bad guys. We're talking about they want to be elected. They want to get elected. They have to respond. One of the things that people learn, rural people, 
is the need they learn to negotiate, to bargain, sometimes collectively as a community with the politicians. They also thought they need public projects to enhance, to open up their economic options. They found that their need access to, I mean, to negotiate, to bargain, to find a public project, ultimately to get access to the biggest source of funding, government's budget. They found that they tried to deal with government bureaucrats for generations, maybe for a lifetime. It rarely worked. They found that politicians were useful, after all. Bangkok people, urban people, educated people always think about those politicians buying votes. Ironically, even people who work in the NGOs for rural development, who keep talking about peasants and rural intellects for, gener for, for decades, once get to this, they didn't trust that people can bargain, people can come up smartly how to deal with the politicians. What happened is that they deal with politicians in order to use politicians to bypass all the government and bureaucracy to get projects, to get funding to them, to get things done. How about corruption? One of my friends called it is a commission. <laughs> of course, I know that we can't win this kind of debate, but just want to give you an idea that it depends on how we see it, and in a way, it's right or wrong, it's your judgment, but people may not care about that commission or that corruption, the high cost of, I mean, politicians finding a way to get resources to the rural sector, as long as they get things done, they get what they want. Of course, in Thailand, self-interest is not democracy, I'm going to mention it in a moment. In Thailand, you have to behave properly. But as we all know, I assume that many of us, most of us, have some kind, let's say, education in, 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 in Western countries. Democracy in the West is all about self-interest. Nothing wrong with that. So Thailand's rural sector is more Western than the urban. <laughs> they found that politicians could bypass the highly centralized and the feudal-like bureaucrats. Elections and politicians became a new uh, political mode, uh, which rural people can access government budget and public funding. Thaksin recognized the change. Thaksin recognized the change. Again, I'm not talking about good guy, bad guys. I'm talking about who recognized the change and then take that opportunity. Rural people found, open, uh, found more open access to opportunity to budget, to bank loans, to public funds. And with taxing, they also get debt defaults and other exemption. Again, academics say that that uh, would damage, I mean, undisciplined fiscal uh, policy would uh, damage uh, the, the country's fiscal condition. But the fact is also that the exemptions is available for 30, 40, 30, 40 years to, to, to industrialists, to exporters, to investors. Look at the board of investment, full of exemption, tax exemption. So now debt default is a kind of exemption that middle class and, and urban educated people cry foul, even though there are people who got those kind of exemptions for, for a long time. For the rural and semi-rural people, democracy is based on self-interest. It's practical, concrete, and effective. It doesn't need a textbook to explain what an ideal democracy is or is not. It has nothing to do with moral and ethical value. Meanwhile, the urban elite do not understand these changes. For them, democracy is an abstract concept that needs to be taught. It is a complicated political system whose ideal is noble and moral. In Thailand, a combination of the traditional ideology or moral authority based on Buddhist concept of merit, make, of merit. This makes democracy a kind of period, Puritan political imagination that requires higher learning in order to understand uh, or practice democracy properly. Self-interest would probably be the lowest possible justification for democracy. 
for the urban educated class, democracy and the one of the uh, 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 their democracy and the one of rural people clash. Second fundamental factor. I'm going to go fast because many people predict that I'm going to talk about the monarchy, so I'm going to talk less. Thai monarchy is one of the most misinformed. I mean, we are, we are, Thai monarchy is a subject that we are most misinformed or poorly understood. Look at scholarship on Thai monarchy. You can find that if, if you can, if a large number, as, I mean, as much, as many as it is, you can find a huge proportion proportion of them are produced in the past four or five years. Before that, is the kind of subject that people don't, for all kinds of reasons, people do the work. The political roles of Thai monarchy and royalism, especially in the current reign of King Pumipon, have been entirely misunderstood. First of all, the absolute monarchy in Siam emerged with the consolidation and expansion of the power stronger than any previous uh, uh, regimes in the country history. Siam started as a modern state under the tutelage, under the, the, the control, under manipulation, and according to the interests of the monarchy. By the way, I talk about monarchy here, I make it clear that I'm not t talking about the monarch. Duncan McCargill used the word network monarchy. I mean the same thing, but I just, I'm going to just mention it as a monarchy. It means a huge number of people, not the individual king, that form together to become a kind of uh, vested interest group. So I use the word monarchy in that term. As you know, Thailand lays majesty law. We can violate the law if we criticize the monarch and the heir to the throne. I'm not talking about the monarch. I'm talking about everybody in the monarchy, okay? And you might wonder why I have to say this Singapore. I just learned the past month that Thai Les Majesty Law, I thought all the time that it doesn't cover as long as I'm outside Thailand. I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah. Practically, they expand extraterritorial uh, power to everywhere. Uh, but legally, I thought that just practically that's bad enough. I, I learned just the past month that legally, Thai citizens can be arrested for the activities that they did outside Thailand only once they enter the country. <laughs> so that, oh, I don't know what, uh, what the legal uh, is that, but anyway. Uh, so the, the Thai state, in a way, the Thai state has been built with the monarchy, intrinsically with the monarch monarchical interest in its state. It is one of the subjects that just a month ago I gave a talk in Thailand and, and I'm not going to, to elaborate here because it's another huge subject and in fact closely, more closely related to the subject, to the project I'm working for Ari. It, uh, the legacies of the absolute monarchy in Thailand uh, is much stronger than, than people realize. Then one of them is, is the ideas about the state and another one of them is, uh, is about the monarchy, how the monarchy evolved and changed since the absolute monarchy. In many ways, we can understand, speaking as a historian, only when we understand since the absolute monarchy. I'm not going to go to, to that far. The absolute monarchy ended in 1932. It was regarded as the beginning of Thai democracy and open up the opportunity for political participation of, uh, of the commoners. But the central issue that caused a serious rift among the revolutionaries for years and eventually weakened the revolutionary regime was how to deal with the monarchy. So even the revolution in 1932, in the, in the end, not only the revolutionaries of that time did not abolish the monarchy. In fact, they led the monarchy back at the end of World War II. By 1947, the royalists struck back, collaborating with the military regime that allowed royalists to return to prominence again. 
up and down for about 10 years, from 1947 to 1957, and steadily stronger and stronger since 19, uh, 1957 up to the present time. The rise of the monarchy and its political role coincided with the beginning of the reign of King Pumipon. The royalist's most important political project was to restore political dominance of the monarchy, but they realized that they cannot return to absolute monarchy, and they had no such desire because they saw the downside of returning to, to absolute monarchy. Not only people couldn't accept it anymore, there is a downside. So since 1947, among the ideologues of the monarchies has come up with a better idea how to make the, the dominance of the royalists uh, safer and more secure. With the common phrase that we know, even in English, that the monarchy is above politics, right? This is not a play of word, but this is the way I explain it. The word above in Thai English has the same meanings, Psst, plural. The first meaning is that above, this is politics, go out beyond have nothing to do, no connection with politics, right? The second meaning of a verb is this. Is that true? Is that correct? It's a verb as well, right? The word in English and Thai is the same thing. It means this, and it means this. When we use the monarchy as a verb politics, we're supposed to mean this. But what happened for the monarchy found a better way to somehow involve in politics by keep the notion, the concept of the monarchy above politics, but what it means is this. It's above a normal political process. Why not? With the Buddhist concept of moral authority, they're not supposed to be messed up and dirty, get dirty with politics. They're supposed to be cleaner, higher, better, superior, to normal political system and not to engage with those kind of dirty politicians that every one of us in the world now hate. So they remain clean and clear <laughs> with the kind of influence and authority above normal political process. This was developed strongly after and since 1957 with a turning point, ironically, the turning point that we introduced the monarchy into Thai politics is 1973, the popular, uh, the uprising that is known as the beginning of popular democracy is the same moment. Since then, with political turmoil, with political changes, semi-democracy throughout the 80s, the role of monarchy is to support or not to support democracy depends Throughout the 80s, they supported the so-called uh, semi-democracy, which is, uh, in essence, is, uh, is a military-dominated political process with elections, but at the same time, with the people appointed and approved by the monarchy on top of the, of the, of the political system. I, as usual, I, I prepared too much and too long, and... Uh, I prepare, and I can, I can say more if, uh, later uh, if, if, if need to. Uh, three or four points how the, the political success of the royalists. Three or four factors, a combination of four elements that, uh, that make the success of the monarchy in the past 30 years, why, why they became so successful in, 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 in the domination uh, over the uh, normal political process. One is, I, I trace back to the, the Dambaraja Buddhist ideology, how it is reconceived, rearticulated since 1947 and become I just concretized uh, by the present reign, by the present monarch into many concrete projects that make a Dambaraja, again, a kind of very archaic, very classical Buddhist concept become more concrete, understood in the modern term. Second, the new monarchy, I call it new monarchy, has to be popular. After all, politics since the absolute monarchy, since the absolute monarchy, has been popular politics. I mean, relatively different degrees of public sphere. Yet, it is unlike a pre-absolute monarchy 
when politics is a kind of maybe closed door behind the door. But since the politics become, I mean, involve public sphere, much more so in the past television age and after and internet age, politics has to be popular. It, it, it is within public sphere all the time. So the monarchy has to be, has to be popular. The third factor that makes it success is I call royal capitalism. Uh, we don't need to go into, I have some statistics. Just mention two or three things. Uh, Forbes listed the present monarch as among the top or the richest person in the world since 2006. Sometimes the richest, sometimes the second, sometimes depends. And also, if you look at the Crown Property Bureau, it's another uh, source of, of, of resource for the monarchy. And one indicator that I mentioned, I'm, I'm skip and mentioned briefly, is that the annual budget. Annual budget, Ty, annual budget for the Thai royal household is twice the British monarchy. Some people here might know Ajahn Sulak Sivarak. Okay, most of you may not. Sulak Sivarak is one of the most uh, royalists. He's a royalist who are more critical to, to the monarchy. He said he supported the monarchy system because monarchy is cheap. I'm not sure he's right. <laughs> At least he's more expensive than the British one. Uh, and uh, the fourth factor, uh, the fourth factor is uh, that I I'm going to mention more is 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 the uh, is the royalist democracy. From the 1980s to 2000s, the parliament were usually fractured and fragile. While the governments were weak. Uh, it is no secret, it is no secret the royalists prefer a system that grants more power to the non-elected. Clean, uncorrupt, noble, professionals, and technocrats. During the time, we also see the role of military decline. In contrast, the monarchy became more politically active. Interventions by the palace became more and more frequent in various forms. Of course, if you ask the embassy people, they say no. But anybody who involved, ask any journalist in Thailand, they know this. They're more and more interventive. They're more and more interfere with the government, how the government runs. Let's say from the simple thing, I just mentioned the example of the more simple thing, interfere in the appointment of the army top positions, interfere in the appointment of the top position in Ministry of Interior and local administration, which control all, all the, all the demo decentralization project, interfere with the, with the, with the uh, irrigation department in the agricultural ministry, interfere in, do you think about it? What Bangkok people complain about traffic when the royal motorcades pass through? That is a little, 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 little tip of the iceberg. This is royalist democracy that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about traffic jams. <laughs> Having the monarchy on top of the normal but weak democratic system, perhaps this cartoon would give you a good sense. The translation of the Thai words is below. We think about election as people's voice, people vote, individuals are important. You see, Thai, Thai election is like this. Having people gather together and pray to whom? To that voice. Whose voice? The king's voice. This is on election day in April 2006. Needless to say, the politics of the monarchy has rarely been recognized the way it actually is, either by scholars, journalists, or observers, thanks partly to the less majesty. Hyper-royalism gets stronger over the years. King Pumipon has become a sacred cult. He cannot be mentioned in public with, without the highest praise. Any slight, let alone a serious criticism, is forbidden and is punishable. Royalist democracy survived by the cult of King Pumipon. But 
We are coming, we are approaching to the final period of the reign. Like it or not, this is happening. Even if he could survive 10 more years from now, the anxiety over the succession will not go away. In fact, the ongoing jockeying among the kingmakers and competition among palace circles are likely to intensify. In fact, it has started since 2006 coup. The combination of the rural society change and the political role of the monarchy and the fact that the present reign is coming to an end has merged by 2006 because, I mean, on the one hand, people may talk about toxins, corruption, but the main factor that the royalists took action because they are afraid of toxin. They're afraid of toxin's role, influence in being the kingmakers, having influence to dictate, manipulate, or somehow affect the outcome of the succession that could happen any time. The ulterior motive of the 2006 coup is not about corrupt politicians. It's about jockeying for position for the succession. But both of them are not going to go away. Both issues are not going to go away. I don't have time to talk about the anti-monarchy, and if we can, we, we can do it later, but otherwise uh, we can take another time. In September, there will be a conference at ISIS on the Thailand events, and one of the subjects that I was assigned, I am assigned, is to talk about anti-monarchy, going back to 1912 up to the present time, so maybe keep for that. Had the succession not been a factor, it is very false possible that the tension between existing royal, royalist democracy and the changing rural society might not be as explosive as it is. Had the parliamentary system remained fragile and weak without Thaksin like political leader, the succession might not less a concern. Thaksin was allegedly a threat to the monarchy. How so? Because he was a major rival to many monarchies, kingmakers who were jockeying for the position in preparation for the succession and of, uh, the future of the monarchy. In other words, Thaksin's popularity posed danger to the interests of the monarchy and network only because the reign of King Pumipon might come to an end at any time. Given this critical transition, the monarchies, kingmakers cannot tolerate a powerful political regime. Good or bad, that doesn't matter. And I'm not a pro taxine I'm not talking about he is good. I'm talking about power struggles. Despite several costs and political crises, this is one of the fundamental factor. Now, I'd like to end the talk. I have many more, but in the talk, just thinking about these two factors. It is policy 101, as I said. It could happen in many other countries. And don't you think the so-called rise of Asia in the past few years and for years to come, very likely to produce major social changes, along, not along, exactly along this line, but let's say a transformation social change versus the obstinate, the existing political system that refused to go, refused to reform. Where is the next one? A month ago, I saw a census, or I think it reports about new census of China. Look at the numbers about rural society in China. Maybe China is big enough to absorb some kind, I mean, conflict and, and cushion a lot of tension, maybe. And China has proved since Tiananmen Square uh, incident 20 years ago that, uh, in, in fact, yes, it has been able to absorb that kind of conflict and then turn to the next page. How about Vietnam? Vietnam seems to follow similar paths to Thailand in terms of agriculture and, and, and industrialization. Indonesia looks good, but a year before Suharto's fall, political pundits didn't expect Suharto's fall. And a year after Suharto's fall, nobody predicts such a democracy as we see it now because with ethnic conflicts and a lot of tragedies across Indonesia, 
those political pundits just ask where it's going to end. Not only it ended, Indonesia now is, I mean, flourishing democracy. But whenever people brag about it, I always tell them, hey, take a look how Thailand or Philippines were seen a few years ago. This kind of political astrology has a short life. <laughs> so I think, I hope that uh, I just end by, by, by talking basically about those two factors. Even though other countries may not have the monarchy, or their monarchy may not like the Taiwan, but let's say, don't you think we have monarchies everywhere? <laughs> <laughs> it's... it's Who knows? The Singaporean election uh, a month ago. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to criticize nowhere. <laughs> I'm just going to mention that what happened in the election, it reflects something of the change along this line, maybe not the same scale. Right? Everything in Singapore is a different scale. <laughs> uh, but think about that See, uh, and, and, and think about Vietnam. I was asked a few months ago about Burma. I, as far as I know, maybe I don't know enough, I don't think the kind of social change in Burma is as extensive as we thought. It's basically much more in the political circle. But let's say I'm talking about social change, big social change, that uh, Polisai 101 tells us that it's a result of the, I mean, those kind, not usually, result of economic uh, booms. I skip this anti-monarchy. This is the last part, and I really end here. You might say that it's impossible. I agree. So I end with a pessimistic note, coming back to talk about Thailand again. The only way to get out is first let electoral democracy run its course. Those two issues are relatively secondary, I mean minor issues. Not minor, secondary. The primary one, let election run its course. Let democracy run its course. Even this, the upcoming election, nobody in Thailand would tell you, would guarantee that there was no coup. The only people who guarantee that there will be no coup is the commander-in-chief. <laughs> Second one, solve the succession crisis. In Thailand, 99.9% .9 people think about solving this by replacing the unpopular person with the more popular one. That would open the Pandora box. That could jeopardize and destroy the whole family. I'm not going to mention what family. In Thai world, it's going to go back to late Ayutthaya period. <laughs> so I hope that they won't do that. There is another way to end the succession crisis. Make the monarchy politically irrelevant. It may be harder to do than change a person, but this will last longer. This will save the monarchy. Thai elite are afraid of anti-monarchy thinking. If they allow, if they allow people to discuss publicly about the role monarchy in Thai democracy. I'm pretty sure that the majority of Thai will insist that they want to keep the monarchy. Thinking about Australia, I saw Michel here, so I think about Australia. Australia has been, have, have been having many referendums, whether or not they like to have the queen or not, right? Up to the present time, the Republic, the Republican people lost. If Australia still lost, there's no way that the Republican in Thailand would win any referendum. <laughs> so an open talk about the role of the monarchy would be the safest way to keep the monarchy in the long run. But I think the end of the public discussion, I hope, I think and I hope, will make the monarchy politically irrelevant. The first key to make that happen, again, just the key, I, from the big to smaller, even still difficult. I'm going down to the very concrete issue, still difficult, 
The key to open up the door for public discussion is to abolish the less majesty law. Thank you very much.